The shock of hearing the voice was so great that Doctor Who had barely time to complete the materialization process. But old habit was strong, and smoothly and efficiently the TARDIS slid through the trans-dimensional flux and fitted its rearranged atoms into the new sphere. By all the Doctor's coordinates and calculations, this world should be the planet Vortis. But just where on the planet, or when in the timescale of that world, he could not as yet know. He drove home the last lever and, with hands on the edges of the control panel, panted with excitement. The voice through his radio had been talking in modern English. He strapped the walkie-talkie apparatus on his shoulders. Already clad in the atmospheric density jacket he remembered having needed on his previous visit to this ill-omened world. Then, activating the great door, he stood waiting for it to open, fidgeting with impatience. This was not at all like the Vortis he remembered, was his first thought as he peered out through the open portals. True, there were several moons in the sky, two of them so close to the planet that they could be seen in daylight. The sparkles he remembered were in the sky also, but the mists were not there, nor the white basaltic needle-like spires. Quite evidently, his TARDIS had landed him in an entirely different part of the planet. He walked steadily through the doorway, the voice from the radio still murmuring in his ears. He'd first heard it during the materialization of his ship from interdimensional non-space into the real space in which Vortis swam. The voice sounded low and weary and consisted of but few words. It was as though the effort to dredge the words out was almost too much for the throat uttering them. Help! Help! The voice was muttering. Beware, Zabi Supremo. Warn Earth. Warn Earth. That was all. It was so tantalizingly obscure that Doctor Who was almost dancing with impatience as he set foot outside his ship. But what he saw when he looked around the landscape momentarily drove all else from his mind. He was on a low plateau, overlooking a broad plain. At least it should have been a plain, for the ground itself seemed flat enough. It was the structures that reared themselves up from the plain that made the eyes almost start from his head. On every side and outwards as far as the horizon, there reared up from the ground a multitude of cone-like structures, like dunces caps, like sugar loaves, like... And now, he knew for certain that he was back on Vortis, just like ant hills. He darted back inside the ship and re-emerged with binoculars. He trained the glasses on the cones nearest to him and his gaze roamed over the surface, confirming that his first deduction was only too true. These monstrous hills of maybe a hundred feet high were the counterparts of the ant hills or termitories to be seen in the southern hemisphere of Earth, and, crawling all over them, in and out of the holes, were the hideous inhabitants of Vortis, the huge ants or termites known as the Zabi. Fascinated, he allowed the glasses to lead his gaze over first one immense hill and then another. There they crawled. Hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of them, those noxious mindless creatures controlled from a distance by some unknown intelligence who preyed upon the likeable innocent butterfly people, the Menoptera, the other species native to Vortis whom he had encountered on his last visit. He had seen but little of the Zabi themselves then, but he'd heard enough to know they were to be dreaded. Help! Help! Beware, Zabi Supremo! The voice in his earphone droned on. Warn Earth! Warn Earth! He started as the voice again penetrated into his consciousness. Somewhere not too far away from him was a man of Earth. He seemed to be weak and was perhaps wounded or a prisoner somewhere in that veritable maze of termitories. The doctor stared somberly at the forest of cones and lowered the glasses. On his walkie-talkie, there was, of course, a directional aerial, and he began to twist the knob, listening as the sound of the voice sank or grew louder. At last, he determined roughly the quarter where the sound originated. 
He turned his face in that direction. It looked no different from any other part of the plain of anthills. But somewhere out there must be the owner of that tired voice. That voice that cried out hopelessly on an alien planet for a rescue of which it had lost all hope. But Doctor Who had made up his mind that rescue he would attempt, no matter where it led him or through what perils. That his first greeting on Vortis should be the sound of a human voice speaking in his own native tongue was so extraordinary a thing that the Doctor knew that fate had directed his hands as they'd locked home the controls which had precipitated the TARDIS into the sphere of Vortis at this precise place and at this precise time. As he approached the Termitories, he was almost deafened by the shrill chirping of the millions of Zabi as they crawled about their mysterious business. On Earth, ants and termites have no real voices. They communicate by rubbing their back legs together. Doctor Who reflected that he could very well be mightily in error if he was to assume that these Zabi were just very large ants or termites. These loathsome creatures could very well be some entirely different type of creature from the ants and termites which had evolved on Earth even though they were insectile. They seemed to take no notice of him as he passed, trembling close to their hills. Of course, he avoided getting too close to any of them for he could see that most of these Zavi were of the soldier class. This was evident from their huge powerful mandibles which, in a creature of that size, could tear the limbs from a man just as a man might tear apart a roasted chicken. The voice over the radio was stronger now, so that the doctor felt that he was getting very close to its source. Walking as warily as he could, and avoiding contact with any of the Zabi, he trod softly on the sandy surface of the ground, his gaze moving constantly about. Now, he switched on his sender and spoke urgently into the microphone. Help is here, he said, Direct me to where you are. Give me some landmark to go by. I'm coming to you. But the radio gave him back no reply, only the monotonous low repetition of the message that he'd first heard. Baffled, he looked around him at the jungle of termitries and shuddered to think of his own position, one feeble, weaponless earthman, alone amongst these hordes of malevolent, giant insects, searching for the owner of a voice which could not hear him. Looking for a needle in a haystack would be simplicity itself compared to his task, he told himself irritably, but he reflected grimly a needle would glitter, wouldn't it? That was just what he could see ahead of him now, a dull glitter that lay athwart two ant hills relatively close to each other. Excitedly now, he pressed on until he came to the thing. It was circular and was half buried in the sandy soil. On every side rose the gigantic ant hills, and here it lay, like a child's lost ball, unspied by the Zabi, many of whom were even then crawling over the sand that had gathered on the top. Doctor Who sensed that he'd reached his objective. He was convinced that inside this sphere was the owner of the voice, now sounding much louder in his earphone. He squatted down on the sand and for five minutes he spoke urgently into his microphone. But it was soon obvious that whoever was inside the sphere, if indeed there was anyone inside it, either had no receiver or else one that was out of order. He leaned forward and rapped sharply on the metal surface. There was no reaction. He felt in his pocket and producing a torch he began a tattoo on the same place as before. Then he moved on and around speculating that the hull of a spaceship must be very thick and searching for a thinner place. Thus it was that he came upon the door, half buried in the sand. The hollowness of his knocking told him there was emptiness behind it. Getting to his knees, he began to scoop away the sand and soon uncovered the door. A small circle, just about large enough for a normal man to wriggle through. In his excitement, he leaned against it and the next moment he'd fallen in through the doorway and into an open space. The door closed, evidently, on powerful springs. It was hot and close and dark, and he reflected that it must be an airlock, now broken, and that there would be another door into the ship proper. His torch soon revealed it, 
and he put his shoulder against the panel. It needed all her strength to force it open against extremely powerful springs, but finally, with a mighty heave, he was inside the ship. Breathing hard through the breathing apparatus necessary for the thin air of Vortis, he got to his feet and smoothed down his clothes. My goodness, he murmured to himself, now here is a fine thing, not a soul to greet me upon my word. Then he stopped, for the voice he'd been hearing on the radio was now coming directly to his ear, and it was coming from a cabinet on the opposite wall of the room. He went closer and saw the reels of the recorder going slowly round and round while the voice seeped hopelessly and monotonously from the speaker, repeating over and over again the appeal for help and the warning. He stared round him bitterly. So this was the end of his search. A tape recorder, endlessly sending out its message while no one lived and breathed here. He was as much alone as he'd been before. Exasperated, he stared round him at what was evidently the control cabin of a spaceship. Compared to his TARDIS, it was, of course, a very primitive spaceship, but he could recognise many of the principles which, in his own ship, were so refined that only an expert could have seen the resemblance. A ship like this would require quite a crew. Where were they? Was this ship like the Marie Celeste, which was found drifting crewless on the Sea of Earth? Just so this spacecraft lay, marooned and crewless on this cruel planet of Vortis, so far from where men lived and laughed under the bright sun. Then it was as though the heavens opened. He heard a voice. Something in him told him this was a human voice and no electronic reproduction. It was calling for help, and the sound came from a round port. He struggled and fought with the unfamiliar mechanism, and at last the door opened. He put his head through and his heart lightened. There were two people in there, a man and a boy. Both lay on mattresses and the man looked as though he was dead. His eyes were closed and his head had fallen sideways, but the boy was very much alive. He was sitting up on the mattress and crying out to the rescuer. Earth was the boy's original birthplace, the doctor decided, and the 20th century was his period. That was obvious. His name was Gordon Hamilton and he was the son of the man who lay motionless on the mattress. All the others have gone, the boy told him. Father was ill, so they left us with food and water and went out to explore. You see, we didn't know where we were. We, we crash landed and father was injured. The others left us here and went off to get help. We could hear noises outside, which told us the planet wasn't uninhabited. And so the voice in the recorder asked the doctor, what is that? Father made the recording before he lost consciousness, Gordon said. By that time, we'd given up all hope that the others would ever return, and also we'd seen through the other window those things out there. Dad said they must be for an invasion of Earth. There aren't any other planets inhabited in the solar system. You, you should see them, hundreds and hundreds of them. Now, Sonny, wait a minute, Doctor Who protested. Not so fast. If you talk of the solar system, why, this planet is nowhere near. Tell me, how long had your ship been traveling? What is emotive power? Oh, we've been in space for two years, the boy said. Father's ship moves by anti-gravity and can travel many times the speed of light. The doctor reflected. This boy, quite evidently, had not the least notion that Vortis was not even in the Milky Way. A spaceship traveling even at many times the speed of light would need millions of Earth years to traverse the waste space between galaxies. There was a mystery here. But this was scarcely the time to argue. He must see what could be done for the poor fellow lying on the mattress. In spite of all his ministrations, however, he could get no response at all from the unconscious man, although his breathing was even enough. He was bearded, but evidently not old. There seemed to be no injury to the body, and, baffled, the doctor got up from his knees and looked around. How many were in the crew, he asked, staring around the small cabin-shaped like segment of a circle which he judged to be one of the living quarters. There were six, Gordon told him, all scientists like father. They took weapons and food and they've been gone for five days now. I looked through both ports and saw the spaceships on one side and the big hills on the other. There are things crawling about on the hills. You came from outside, what are they? And where did you come from? Have you a ship here? 
Which question should he answer first? The doctor wondered. The boy didn't seem to be aware that the Zabi he had seen outside were one of the dominant species on the planet. He was evidently thinking in terms of human beings living on this world and assuming that the six crewmen had been captured or killed outside. What a position to find himself in. He went to the other window and looked out. At first, all he could see was a continuation of the multitude of termitries. Then, a gleam caught his eye. The things were so superficially like the termitries that he could see why he'd not recognized them before. Now, he found he could scarcely see anything else. The things were spaceships of the Archer torpedo type. They were almost as tall as the anthills, but as he looked, he discerned that their outline was smooth and regular and that they gave out a deceptive gleam. He turned to the boy. You said they were spaceships, my boy. How did you know that? They couldn't very well be anything else, could they? And the boy gave a youthful grin. They're like rockets they used on Earth in the first half of the century. They must travel by chemical explosions. They'll be slow enough, and if we could get the Solar Queen repaired, we could get back to Earth and warn them of the invasion. Bless my soul, boy, snapped the doctor. What nonsense are you talking? Warn Earth indeed. Why, we're millions and millions of miles from Earth. We're in a different space and a different time. And what's this talk of invasion? Who's going to invade Earth? I'm only telling you what my father told me, said the boy stubbornly. Before he went unconscious, he used to lie still as though he was listening. He said there were messages sort of drifting into his mind. He said it was almost like eavesdropping on someone else talking by radio or telephone. But it wasn't either of those because there wasn't any apparatus. He said there was a force on this world which was intent on invading Earth. Water was what they wanted, water and vegetation. There were millions of them, but always the talk seemed to be about just one individual, Dad said. He didn't get many details. Most of the images that came into his mind didn't have any meaning for him. But the parts about the spaceships were very clear. Father knows about things like that. He'll be very interested in your ship. I shouldn't be surprised about that, said the doctor dryly. Well, all you tell me is very interesting, Gordon, but we're wasting time. I'm a scientist. I came here by a, a different route than you did. My ship is outside in a safe place, I hope. What we must now do is to work out some plan of campaign. We've time enough, said the boy in a matter-of-fact tone. Dad says Earth at present is on the other side of the system, and it'll be months before the world is in a position, you see, for the spaceships to travel there. Doctor Who looked at him curiously. Did your father tell you any more about his ideas as to where this planet is? He asked. Oh yes, said the boy brightly. It's a rogue planet, he said. Not one of the sun's real family. Those moons we can see, he said, are the outer moons of Jupiter, some of them. All the other planets are in the same plane of the ecliptic, but this one isn't. He said it's been driven into the solar system under power. He said that if we could get out into the open at night, we'd see the solar system from an angle no other people have ever seen it from. The doctor reflected within himself, without answering. It sounded all very wild and unlikely, and he told himself irritably, downright impossible. But then, many of his own voyages would sound impossible to an ordinary person. This boy sounded tough and strong. He hadn't seemed frightened when the doctor had come upon him, marooned on an alien world, his father motionless and speechless, and all of his friends vanished. The doctor realized that Gordon would be his only helper in what he decided must be done. We've got to follow your friends, he said tersely. No use cowering in here. I've got a feeling they won't come back without our help. The boy caught in his breath. You mean they've been captured, he muttered. But they all had weapons. They were scientists. They... The doctor looked at him. The boy looked frightened enough now that the situation was put coldly to him. But this was no time for squeamishness. We've got to go and find them, he said as he got up. Your father is as comfortable as we can make him. We'll take food and weapons and we'll secure your ship. And we've got to hurry. Five days, you say, we haven't a moment to lose. <laughs>